Welcome everybody uh, to tonight's event. Firstly, I would like to acknowledge the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. Um, they're the traditional uh, owners of, or custodians of the land that I'm speaking to you from tonight. I'd like to acknowledge their elders, past, present and emerging. Uh, welcome to the edit. I'm Rachel Dexter. Um, if you've been to one of these before, I will be a familiar face to you. If you're new, welcome. Uh, I'm on the board of the Melbourne Press Club, uh, one of the co-hosts of the edit events for young people and uh, young journalists uh, and early career journalists, student journalists as well. Um, and I am also a reporter at The Age newspaper. So um, welcome to my office today. Um, thanks for coming along to another lockdown uh, version of the edit. Um, we were really looking forward to having this one in person upstairs at the pub at the Imperial and have a, a drink with you all. But um, obviously the virus has other plans, but uh, really appreciate the ones who have been able to pop online instead. Um, a little bit about the edit. It's Melbourne Press Club's program for students. Uh, young and early career journalists. It's, it's supported by the Copyright Agency Cultural Fund and it's a space where you can learn new skills and ask curly questions, meet your colleagues and mentors. Um, we'll run for about an hour tonight uh, and I'll introduce our special guest in a moment. Um, I like to keep these conversations as casual and as frank as we can. Uh, we started these events as uh, you know, meant to be a safe space for, for journalists by journalists so that we could have, you know, talk frankly and honestly about the work that we do. So I'd appreciate if we can follow Chatham House rules tonight, even though we're online. So no live tweeting is what that means. Um, we're going to keep this in inside chat. Um, if you have a question for um, our guest, Aaron, um, please use the Q&A function on Zoom. Um, I'll work through as many of those as I can throughout the night with our hour. Um, and just before we get started, I want to spruik our upcoming press club events. Um, on the 8th of September, we have uh, a media and the media and health literacy, which will be focusing obviously about um, how to report health in a way that's uh, accessible, especially in the COVID times. Um, on the 15th of September, we have Lisa Miller. So ABC's Lisa Miller, she'll be uh, interviewed by Michael Rowland, her co-host, co about her book, Daring to Fly. On the 6th of October, we have um, an event called uh, about the book Upheaval with Mac Matthew Rickardson, which is about the transformation of journalism over the decades. And our next edit session uh, will be on September 29, where we're going to be discussing the importance of pictures and photos and visuals in journalism. So uh, the, the guests for that event will be 7.30 video journalist Chris Gillett and illustrator Tia Cass, who's uh, been published in the Saturday Age and won a number of quills. So before further ado, uh, I would like to introduce our special guest tonight. Welcome, Aaron Young from Ticker, who Hello. will pop up on your screen. Hello. Welcome, Welcome to Ticker. Yeah, Hello. shame we can't be having a drink. Indeed, indeed. But um, the beauty of this is that we all get to see in, literally inside Tico where you are right now. Um, so for those of you who don't know, I assume you do because you signed up to this event, but, you know, I will go through it anyway. Um, Aaron, you began your career in newspapers before you moved across to radio news and eventually to TV. You were one of the founding you were the founding anchor of RT in Moscow in 2005 and a journalist for the Sky News Business Channel. Um, you're probably both most well known in Melbourne media circles as being the face of, of the Sky News Bureau in Melbourne as Bureau Treach there where you worked for 13 years. And then in recent years, uh, you took the plunge to create your own purely online news organisation, uh, Ticker. So now employing 20 journalists, Ticker broadcasts live 17 hours a day and offers pre-recorded programming focusing on topics of interest to professional millennials around the world, all without ads, might I ask. So I can't wait to hear how you do it. Thank you so much for uh, joining us tonight, Aaron. Yeah, thank you. I think now you've gone through all that. We can wrap it up and have a drink. Yeah, right? that was great. So that's 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 oh, that's the session. That. No. <laughs> um, so Aaron, um, considering our 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 audience, 
Um, we're all young professionals or we're just getting our foot in the door. Everybody loves the um, how did you get here story. So yeah. um, as we do with every guest, can you talk us a little bit through your career? Where did you grow up? Where did you study? And what was your first gig in journalism? Yeah, sure. Well, um, there's kind of many roads that people take, right, to get into the media. And mine was all over the place, but it was just opportunistic, really. So um, knew from a very young age, like six or seven years old, that I loved TV. It was this um, little place I grew up in, Rye, down on the Mornington Peninsula at the back beach. This time of year is like really dreadful. It's cold and isolated. And so um, I would try and escape by essentially creating TV studios. And, and I just loved this window on the world, um, which I otherwise didn't have. So we would climb on the roof and put up, um, uh, you know, wooden TV towers as a little kid. And then my mum moved us to a hippie commune and I used my pocket money um, to, uh, you know, out of crepe paper, uh, there's a picture there that's just on the screen now at the top uh, of that little studio when I was about seven years old uh, of the Channel 7 studio in the 1990s. There's the weather that I would literally put on the blue wall, the camera out of cardboard there, and then on the right-hand side, um, you know, I'd, I'd borrow from the library the map of the world so that I could trace it, cut it out and put it, and I'd sit there and, and off I go. And, and down beneath is uh, the photo of the first kind of professional studio that I built when I was at Sky. Um, this was one where we had, you know, a proper designer come in. I'd actually been building the sets uh, myself for Sky, both in Melbourne and also for Perth, because at, at, for a very long time, you know, Sky uh, had a, a very entrepreneurial vibe. It's very, very, you know, ultra professional these days. It's come a long way in that regard. Um, but getting back to the story, uh, when I was in high school, I just did a lot of work experience, one at a local newspaper called the Southern Peninsula Local in Rosebud. Um, and it was just great. Like, I love the vibe. It was, um, I'm sure much as how you feel, Rachel, about newspapers, there's just so much you can do. Um, TV is kind of limiting in that regard. Um, you have to have pictures, but I really just loved learning how to convince people to tell you their stories. And we had to get like 40 original stories a week. I got a job straight out of high school. I'd sent, um, I had done work experience at Wynn in Ballarat, local radio, uh, as well as um, at the local paper as many times as they'd allow me. And uh, from there, um, basically, I got a job at the local newspaper because one day a guy went into our year 10 coordinator's office, I was in year 12 at the time, with a, a knife threatening to kill the coordinators. And Channel 7 and 9 and all these helicopters were rocking up out the front. We had so many things happen at Rosebud Secondary College. We oh put a bureau there. Oh, it was crazy. And uh, I rushed out of my English class, went to the media room, picked up a digital camera, <laughs> took a photo of what was going on and gave it to the local newspaper. And they rewarded me with a job straight out of high school. So that was how that kind of kicked off. Um, then after about a year, we had the former property editor of The Age who came and bought the was looking for a sea change, bought the paper, tried to turn it into a bit of a weekender for Portsy. Um, oh, yeah. Didn't quite sense. work out, unfortunately. <laughs> a great idea, but it didn't actually work. The paper was about to close. I left. And then at age 19, after all of this excitement of a year, we're talking about 2001, um, yeah. I'm, uh, I'm working at Woolies in Mento and, uh, you know, trying to get trying to get going from there. So kind of the highs and the lows and the highs and the lows, and that's what my career has been about the whole time. Yeah. And can you just, I guess, maybe give us the summary of sort of, you know, where where you spent the most amount of time in your career, obviously Sky, but you've, you've, you've been around the world. Yeah. So um, after that experience, I started working at Joy Radio when they had, they had just started mm -hmm. broadcasting. They had got their full-time licence. And I went in for a chat and next thing I'm the breakfast newsreader. Um, and I had braces and no one could understand what I was saying, but I was so passionate about what I was doing. <laughs> and about three months in, my braces came off. And uh, I was like, if I'm doing this for them, why don't I start my own little business? So yeah. out of my partner's house in South Yarra, um, I set up, got a microphone and set up a radio news business called Como Network News, um, where I would produce radio news bulletins 7, 8, 9 and 10 in the morning, 4, 5 and 6 in the afternoon and sell them to local radio stations around Victoria who needed a community. Who didn't have service. a newsreader. Right. Okay. And they were, many of them, buying their news service from 3AW. Wow. And so I was cutting 3AW's price by half. <laughs> and then one day I get a call from Rob Curtin saying, 
would you just come and join us? So that's how I got my first job in uh, Metro Radio. And there you then go. There, uh, moved to London. Um, I'd covered the uh, Asian tsunami in 2004, went over there for two weeks, uh, and then moved to London in uh, 2000, and I think it was five, yeah, early 2005, went to Rome to cover the death of Pope John Paul II, uh, first Australian journalist on the scene of the London bombings, covering that yeah. forever, um, and then accidentally got a job in Moscow, left and lived in Russia working at RT, which has turned into a crazy right-wing propaganda network. There's um, something about you in places like <laughs> It's kind of an ongoing joke. Uh, and as you and I were discussing beforehand, my dog's named Tucker, so people think I've named him after Tucker Carlson or Fox News, so really kind of keeping the thing going. Um, but, uh, yeah, so whenever I seem to leave an organisation, it goes right wing uh, and, uh, and, and off it goes. So from there, um, my mum had a baby when I was 24 years old in 2006. I came back to meet him, happened to stop by Sky News in Sydney, and the news director, yeah. Ian Cook, said, we'd love to give you a job. So... Back then, it was a, just a rolling news channel. Uh, it was very exciting. Moved to Sydney. Four days after I started, they said, a job's just come up in Melbourne. And so I moved to Melbourne and stayed there for 13 years. Thought it was going to last a month. Like, literally, the, it was very much in its infancy back in 2006. It was working out who it was. We didn't have any cameramen um, in the Melbourne right. Bureau. We were based at Channel 9 in Richmond. Um, so I got to learn from the best, but it was like... TV with your hands behind your back in many ways. Yeah, right. Um, did you have anybody, just staying on this topic for a second, did you have anybody that really stands out in your career that sort of took you under your, your wing or who, who really, you know, I guess, yeah, who, who were the most influential sort of mentors that, that you had along, along your way? Um, I can think of a couple. So one is Zoe Sterling, who was my first editor, and she was just hard ask like she was at the local newspaper um you know this was uh two this was 1999 2001 kind of era mm -hmm. and the paper was owned by three people it was fabulous they were absolutely effing nuts like i would be flying down the mornington peninsula freeway to get to work and they would be having their board meetings on the side of the freeway because they were certain that fairfax were bugging their office to set up their own local newspaper like it was hilarious oh. But they really knew the local community. Like we had a circulation of 4,000. Um, you had to buy the paper, 55 mm -hmm. cents. It was literally a subscription. Um, and to get people to buy your content, you had to be delivering something incredible. So she would teach me, you know, going to court and sitting and listening for great stories or going to um, council and sitting there and hearing the great stories and building relationships. So that was fantastic. And, and she, mm -hmm. she was never nice to me. She was... <laughs> <laughs> it was kind of like the devil wears Prada, but she was great because yeah. there was no chance for me to be what we would call millennial themed. It was like, get in, work your ass off. She would literally say, head down, bum up, I don't want to hear anything. And there was no complaining. It was literally get the job done, break stories and follow what she had done. The other one in terms of broadcast was Peter Hitchner, who I met when I was about 19. Um, and, you know, he had just been, he was great. We've never had that. I went in and I knew people through Joy who introduced me to him and yeah. went in and he was always very, you know, good luck kind of thing. Like there was never any bullshitting um, in our friendship and to this day there still isn't. Um, yeah. And and he was the first person I told that I was about to start Ticker. And, you know, I really love that um, contemporary style broadcasting that he does with mm. the traditions of television and that's what... I guess we've tried to do it ticker. So, yeah, in terms of people who I look up to, um, they're the first two who come to mind. Yeah, for sure. All right, so give us the explanation of what ticker does, right? It's TV news network, streams online with no ads. How do you do it and what's your – who are you when people ask you what, what, what the heck is ticker? We are CNN for people who aren't old businessmen sitting in hotels around the world is how I describe it. So imagine like a millennial version of CNN. We're not on cable mm -hmm. like Fox or Sky or BBC World or CNN because, as we can all see, cable is going in a different direction. So mm -hmm. we are now in a world where, you know, that little kid who was building TV studios like I was um, used to have to own a TV tower or a satellite dish. So it was 
media, mainstream media could only be for billionaires or millionaires who had the money to lose to be able to start something. Mm -hmm. And when the NBN came along, I kind of had started thinking in my mind, well, hang on, this is actually an opportunity if it really turns out to be as good as they say. Hilariously, we don't use the NBN because it isn't good enough. For it is not enough. <laughs> but that's by the by. We learned that and our fourth COO who is watching this, uh, you know, has got a higher forehead than he used to before we started dealing with the internet uh, yeah. issues. But um, uh, so for me, it was like a great opportunity to, to go. I can see that um, media is going left and media is going right and mm. I'm neither. Um, I just like to ask questions and cover interesting stories. So mm -hmm. I think like most entrepreneurs, the business idea comes along from I want something and it doesn't exist. Yeah. And therefore, it was build the business up after that. So breaking news, global news, climate news, tech news, business news. We're not going to cover BHP, but we will cover something, yeah. you know, the, the chip shortage that Apple and that everyone's facing. We will cover the China story at the moment that's happening. We do cover coronavirus, but we don't cover case numbers in Sydney or Melbourne because you'd be covering case numbers of every city around the world. Mm. We decided last year not to be local. So it's tricky because the old saying is all news is local. I find myself, Rachel, in this situation mm. where most of my really great friends don't live in Melbourne. They live in London or they're people I met when I was in Moscow or they live in the US. And we all have similar interests as in we like nice things we like technology we love to travel kind of consider ourselves to be somewhat stateless watch politics and just shake our heads and go like what are you guys doing and then realize that we weren't alone and that i have more in common with that person in london than i do with my next door neighbor in richmond so therefore why not cover a new service which as i say is kind of like cnn but mm. for under 45s who are professional urban millennials and that's where the idea began. There you go. Um, I think most people will, and I'm sure you get this all the time, but they'll go, Aaron, you had a stable job at, you know, a mainstream news organisation. You would, you know, like it, it, it's, it's solid. It was there. You've taken this plunge to essentially try and build up something that you don't know if it's going to work that's kind of, you know, that would be lunacy to a lot of people. Um, you know, you, you were safe there. Follow, but I, not the people yeah. I follow. So I look at that and say, um, when I think of what was going through my head for a good five years prior, I don't know if I would be able to have lived with myself, Rachel, if I didn't mm -hmm. take the plunge, right? So okay. people talk about side hustles. Um, journalism, the truth is, local journalism can start to feel very monotonous the longer you do it. Mm. Um, the 31st of December is my coverage of um, the countdown to New Year's Eve. I could do the live cross off the top of my head. New Year's Day, the police statistics come out for car crashes for the past year, as well as the cleanup from New Year's Eve. Um, then we move into Australia Day where I go to Katani Gardens and interview people and then go to the flag raising ceremony. And on and on and on it goes, the Melbourne Cup, the Grand Prix, mm -hmm. the Grand Final, um, and it was all just it wasn't a challenge anymore. Mm -hmm. And being the Melbourne Bureau Chief, um, I was no longer in charge of staff, so to speak. That wasn't my job or my interest. It was more, um, you know, just the tone of what we're doing in Melbourne. And it was changing. The company had changed and uh, it was no longer about that entrepreneurial build the set yourself. Everyone was moving into a specific role. And mm -hmm. I'm a jack of all trades, perhaps a master of none, um, but <laughs> I really loved all of the different aspects that I used to be able to do in my job that I can now do a ticker. So I think that when you are an entrepreneur, you can kind of feel trapped and you can kind of feel like, um, I was waking up at five in the morning full of anxiety and mm. thinking to myself, um, I know I could be doing something. What is it? And then eventually one day it just became obvious. There was a company called Cheddar in the United States. Um, they had started about four years prior and they began on the New York Stock Exchange floor with a 20-minute daily Facebook Live and turned into a 17-hour-a-day news network in New York covering, you know, ultra-cool tech 
and uh, markets like the NASDAQ. Yeah. And uh, they then sold for $200 million after four years of building it up. So it wasn't that I wanted to replicate, but what that told me is that I wasn't as crazy as what you thought it might be like to take that plunge. Someone else had done it and worked yeah. and I just had to have confidence that I could make it work. Yeah, and it's it, it's a very small pond in Australia as well. You know, we Which is why we went global. Yeah, exactly. Um, so how did you how did you do it? How did you raise the funds that you needed to get this off the ground and how much I mean, without you you I mean having been involved in a radio station, I know that the biggest cost in running an opera and kind of a media organization is transmission costs and you don't have that, you know. So um yeah, can you talk us through how it all works? I know you you don't have ads, so how do you pay your staff? How does it all how does it work without giving you know you, you, your black secret? Oh, your, I'm, your I'm really secrets, open. Right? Like I, I'm really open with everybody because um, they're like I've had it all, Rachel. I've had people think that we're being funded by a foreign government. I've had people think that we have secret billionaires behind the scenes who are running things or or rich listers, um, uh, and and it's just kind of funny to me. And what it tells me is that's what's bloody wrong with media in the first place. It's a screen and what you put on the screen is what matters. And by cutting out, I look at Win TV and I think they're nuts. I think you, instead of doing local news, you're now doing state news and keeping the same technology that you were using 10 years ago when technology has changed so much that outside this office right now, we've got an anchor in Singapore sitting in front of a 65 inch plasma um, using an auto cue that I bought off Alibaba, uh, and going live into a producer with the software and the technology we've created. So we had to create a lot of technology from scratch and it's yeah. an ongoing process. It um, keeps me up at night. It's difficult. Yeah. This giant thing behind me right here is a crane that I just bought, which is automated. So it literally goes up and down off your mobile phone. So we're going to have this beautiful crane shot in our studio, um, which is all automated and people are going to think there are people behind the scenes running it. So the first conversation I had um, when I started Ticker was obviously, how the hell am I going to make this work? Mm -hmm. So the good news was you asked me about um, advice from people. Peter Hitchner once said to me, it's the best advice I've ever had, Aaron, never take a holiday. And I'm like, Why? Because, you know, the old traditional TV idea of if you go away, someone will take your job. And he said, no, God. it'll prevent the bean counters from wanting to get rid of you during redundancies. If you have too much holiday pay, they'll never get rid of you. So for me, by the time I left Sky, I had so much holiday pay owing oh. that I could buy everything that I needed that I didn't already <laughs> own. And right. being the bureau chief at Sky, and I really loved, you know, as I say, the entrepreneurial aspect. I own a lot of equipment. So I think there's a slide we can bring up of the first studio we had at YBF. That's a picture there. Um, that, was, that was actually our second studio. But in that studio, I owned all the auto. This was day one, literally moving into a co-working space. It was tiny. Like it was about 10 square metres. On the right-hand side up the top there is where we would mix the shows. Um, and then on the other side, the, the image we had before was a studio which is literally up against the wall. So it's a tiny space in a co-working space. And this was just to prove that the concept worked. And, um, you know, if you can't tell by now, I'm a little bit of a cowboy when it comes to these things and um, just went, let's just do it. Like, screw it, let's do it. This is the other side. So that's how small the space is, um, putting a wide angle lens on there. And that was our first studio. This is yeah. the graphics that I created at home. Um, I built those frames around the TVs just out of wood. There's my, my puppy Tucker. Um, but, you know, we, we built the sets ourselves. I think the slideshow will show, and this is a set, this goes in tomorrow. This is our brand new studio, yeah, right. which goes in tomorrow. That's a huge LED screen on the left. Mm. This is our first studio. That's where we've come. And, and this is where we're going. So a lot, and that's the drinks tray on the right-hand side of my dad. Um, this was a Saturday in the middle of last year during lockdown of building this set. Um, which are just screens and look how it looks on camera. So right. what I realised is the camera is just what you pointed at. And when we were based at Channel 9 uh, in Richmond around the corner from where this picture was, mm. it was really yuck back mm. in the old days. My dad came in, Steve Brax, the Premier, came in with me for an interview once and he said, is this Channel 9? 
Yeah. Like, yeah. And he was like, oh, I guess it's just what you put the camera at. So this was our last studio in Richmond. That's how it began. Um, that was me on the day that we moved in, getting ready for it all. Very excited. We thought we were going to be here for years and we lasted a year. There's me building the set. Um, and uh, we lasted a year and then went, this isn't good enough and moved in here. That's the where we are now. That was us painting. That's the old Holden boardroom, would you believe? Um, that's in our last studio of our master control. But all this stuff was just about the technology, Rachel. Yeah. So I guess apart from the technology, though, how does the revenue, how do, how, do, how do you make money from Ticker? Obviously, you stream offline off your website um, most of the day and you yep. stream live on off YouTube Twitter. and Facebook yeah. as well. Yeah, so Twitter, uh, we go live every time we do a bulletin, which is the first half hour of every hour. We're about to increase that next week. Um, and we go live on our website. We have um, apps everywhere, obviously, across all the devices. Mm-hmm. Um, last week, we signed up with um, uh, iHeartRadio, so they're now taking us live. I'm yeah. spending all this money on a set and graphics, and we're going great on radio. Yeah, you uh, so, <laughs> uh, But, uh, you know, for us, it's about the whole package. And um, so in terms of getting to that question about how yeah. we make our money, the first call I had was with someone who said, we would love to invest because we can see that you're someone who's come from, you know, you look like you know what you're doing. Um, but we would never invest in a company, a media company these days that relies on subscription or advertising. And I'm like, what the hell else is there? So I went for a bike ride and was like, I'm not getting off this bike until I can think of a way to get off the ground. And so what we realized on day one was we had over a thousand pitches from people wanting to come on ticker to be interviewed by me. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't just by me. It was the fact there was nothing like this. You had all these people with great stories. They could be business people. They could be PR people. They could be whatever it might be. And they all wanted to be interviewed by me. And I would, and then they'd all ask for their clip. They'd be like, oh, do you mind giving us our clip? And I'd be like, yeah, sure. And you can imagine how tired I was. It was literally just me um, on day one. And uh, then um, we, uh, my accountant said, why aren't you charging for this? Why aren't you charging for the clips? You're spending so much time, um, you know, cutting these clips together and put a price on it. And I was like, that's a good idea. So we charged just a couple of hundred dollars and that got us got us by for a little while to go, all right, well, we got a bit of money. You know, we we're doing five interviews an hour, four hours a day live. We, weren't, we don't charge people to come on ticker. I think that's a really important thing to say. Yeah. Um, you know, it's like um, if, if someone went to the age and said, you took a really great photo, I'd like to buy it. That's the equivalent of what we do with it. Yeah, our- right. Makes so sense, channel, actually. It channel 9 charges, Sky charges, the ABC charges. They all charge way more than yeah. Like that. Yeah. So I went, well, let's put a price on what we're doing. We're creating content. And that was a way to cover our costs. And then um, I was listening to the, the audio book about the founder of McDonald's over summer, um, two summers ago. And I started, I just went to like Victoria Gardens, McDonald's, and I'm sitting there. And on the way in, I saw... They had all these posters like get a $2 hamburger and I was hungry, so I wanted a hamburger. And what I noticed is when you get to the counter, you can never find the bloody $2 hamburger. It's just meal deal, meal deal, meal deal. And that's how McDonald's makes their money. They upsell. So I sat there for about four hours watching this McDonald's going, what's the upsell, a ticker for these clips? How can I turn it into something but Mm -hmm. still um, do it while having morals? You know, I didn't Mm -hmm. want to sell my soul. Um, and so then I thought, well, what if we looked after a lot of the people who were coming to us were small business people who wanted to do an interview but didn't understand social media? So what if we did the marketing for them? So we let's say, for example, the first lady who ever came to us was a businesswoman who'd started this fabulous business making pickled eggs. So she came on for an interview about her pickled eggs that she does from home and the Great thing about pickled eggs is they last a really long time um, and they have an unusual taste and I'm sitting there going, great. Um, And then at the end, I was like, what do you think of this package? And she's like, well, what does it do? And I said, well, what we do is we take your interview and then we use Facebook and YouTube and Google to target shoppers and customers who have actually searched for pickled eggs. Mm -hmm. And therefore, we can actually take the interview and put it down there and we'll put a graphic over the top 
We'll tell people how to find your website. And straight away, she took the package, paid us the money. And then she came to us two weeks later and said, I had a 1,000% increase in sales from doing that. Mm -hmm. And I went, that's how we're going to make money. So we did that. And then we kind of went down the path of our ticket original show. So we have about 20 shows on top of our news. They Mm -hmm. each go for 15 minutes. So one is called Ticker Cyber. And it's hosted by a Ticker Originals host, Mike Loder, who's fabulous. And his guest each week, his co-host, is a woman from a company called Cinch. Now, she comes and co-hosts. She's not there to talk about Cinch. She's there to talk about cybersecurity. So this week it was, what's the government doing to protect our data in the census? What's Mm -hmm. the latest stuff coming through from Facebook? And then they'll have a guest who might be from a business or whatever it might be talking about their problems, and then she helps them answer those issues. So we have 15 of those shows, and she powers that show. So she pays us essentially. It's almost like sponsorship, but it's not about her show. It's about the content for the audience. So we never want to feel like infomercials because we don't do them. We talk about the subject but it's powered by a company. And by building those up, we have them around the world now. It's not just Australian companies. We have a sales team now as well. Um, We're able to essentially without having 30-second ads or people having to pay a subscription fee, we're able to make money. And we're making money. We've been able to grow, you know, substantially over the past, particularly the past six months. Interesting. And are those... Um, are those shows, is it, is it sort of disclosed to your audience that your shows are sponsored by certain? We literally have the sponsor bug in the top right corner the entire time. Yeah. Right? Okay. So cool. let's talk yeah. about Channel 9, right? So let's say yeah. Channel 9, and I know that you guys are owned by them. I'm just oh, that's a, as an example. I have no allegiance to no, the no, TV no, network. <laughs> no. So um, let's take what they do, right? We can sell reach, not just views. We can also sell reach. Why? Because if you're scrolling through your Facebook page, Um, Rachel, and we've got something which we've targeted you, you may not stop and watch five minutes of the whole thing. You might watch 30 seconds. You might just see it, but you'll always see the logo from that company in the top right corner, right? Channel 9 can't put their ads in their Twitter feed for their shows because they go to a commercial break. Now, we're so open about it. You know, literally the shows start with um, the, the opener for the show and then it goes powered by Cinch. And then the host comes on and he says, hi, welcome to Ticker Cyber um, Powered by Cinch. They do this. Um, But all views expressed in the program are ours and nothing to do with them. And then goes into the show, introduces her, and at the very end also puts a disclaimer. So as I say, our sales guys, I think, hate me because I come at this company as a journalist saying, um, if we sell ourselves out, we might make 10 grand for that but we'll never earn it back and from how the public feel about us. And so it's just really important to me. And so how then do you explain to people how you, like your journalists are able to be, you know, do rigorous reporting or critical reporting on say, you know, companies if for, that, are, you know, if you're reporting on companies doing the wrong thing or wrongdoing, like does that, does that model ever conflict with, with, you know, I guess, you know, being able to, to do proper, you know, journalism, rigorous journalism? Number one, we separate them. So those programs are a different part of our business called Ticket gotcha. Originals, very yeah. separate to Ticket News, and we make that incredibly clear. And yeah. we're going to continue to make it clear. We're going to change the graphics for those shows. We literally, the, the shows have a different look to our news program, so it never feels yeah. like we're trying to pretend that it's a news program. We don't have journalists host a show like that, we have, as I say, Mike, um, who's an entertainer, um, and that's his role, is to talk to them about the subjects of the week. Um, David Leckie died recently, the former CEO of Channel 7, and one thing I loved about him that your colleague who writes media, Zoe, wrote about him um, from all her her stories, uh, from listening about him, was uh, one day an advertiser of Channel 7 had a huge uh, technical stuff up and were getting really pissed off Um, with Channel 7 that Today Tonight kept covering the story and eventually got through to David Leckie and he said, look, I've got five minutes. Um, You can either keep your your, uh, funds with us, your sponsorship with us. We are going to continue to tell the story, but if you take it away from us, we're going to go 20 times harder and we're going to make your life hell. That's one way of doing it. Our view is, is anyone who comes on, as we say, um, we have a show which is sponsored by... Um, the Australian government, 
Yeah, mm -hmm. news coverage criticises the Australian government all the time. The reason they come on is because it's a news network. Mm -hmm. If we weren't a news network, no one would take us seriously and therefore why would they come on? What would be the value for them? Mm -hmm. um, and that's like we don't want to kind of feel like TVSN um, where you can buy a slot or you can buy the news. That's not at all the vibe. Yeah, cool, cool. So we're getting a few questions coming in already, so I'll start weaving them in. Who watches Ticker? And attention, in theory, sort of what do you have data from what geographic region in the world they're from? And um, someone else has also added, which I'll add into this, um, what are Ticker's audience numbers reach? I just put it out on my LinkedIn and Twitter last week, in fact. We spent, it's really hard to do. I've got an answer, but I'll explain why it's yeah. hard to do because we're on so many different platforms, right? So we have, um, uh, we are on a streaming service overseas in South Africa. We're on one in London. Um, we are obviously on, as I say, Facebook Live, YouTube Live, Twitter Live, um, our own website, Apple TV. I've got this huge chart, iHeartRadio as well, yeah. on, on, on it goes. In fact, my CFO has just literally uh, sent me these stats right now to show them. So thank <laughs> Thanks, you. CFO. Because, yeah, uh, COO, in fact, sorry. But uh, uh, where are we? I'll just get down to it to answer exactly where we're at at the moment. So um, our total new ticket news monthly reach is 4,583,540. The majority of that comes from our website. Mm -hmm. um, then there's the Ticker TV apps that have just under a million um, in terms of reach per month. Ticker News in offices and hotels, so we have deals all over the place and continue yeah. to do that. Ticker News on Twitter, Ticker News on Instagram, the Ticker News newsletters, um, the Ticker News on smart home devices, so Amazon, Alexa, as well as um, Google Home devices as well. Uh, we're on, I've got the pictures in front, RockU, all of the Apple devices, all of the Android devices, obviously Facebook and Instagram. We even snuck on, I'm quite proud of this, on Foxtel now because our Android app, they use Android as a system. We worked out you could download the ticker app on Foxtel so we can be another news channel on Foxtel. Uh, we're on something called Todazon, which is the South African channel, um, Stream, Accenture, um, as well as TV Eyes as well, Flipboard, and just last week, iHeartRadio. Uh, so we are we try to be everywhere, right? Our business yeah. model is to be everywhere and to be free and to not have ads because you're in my generation, Rachel. Um, we love Great Netflix ads. and Netflix doesn't have ads. And the idea of, you know, now a break and we'll ram something down your throat, I'm just not interested in. Yeah, for sure, for sure. So where... Well, where are they from? I didn't answer that. Yeah, uh, where are they from? Are you going hey, to... Only 25% of our audience is based in Australia. Obviously, when we first began, it was about 90. And I've oh. just been going out of my way. Like, we're in a country of 25 million people. And when you are targeting in a urban millennials, um, people who might work at KPMG and have an interest in tech and play guitar and go to a cool bar on a weekend, that's our audience. And they happen to be right around the world. So that's why we've gone global. So 25% is in Australia, 25% is in the US, and then the rest is right across the rest of the world. We built a bureau in Singapore earlier this year with Jackson Williams, a former colleague of mine from Sky. Um, he's over there anchoring literally right now. If you were to go to the Ticket News website, you'd see him there um, going live. And we're trying to build up in Asia too because obviously when we're on during the day is when Asia's on too. We're trying to get to 24-7. Yeah, cool. So uh, Rebecca's asked, Rebecca Elliott's asked, who's your closest competitor or who are your closest competitors? When I started at Sky News, my old CEO, Angelo, said to me, I consider everybody to be a competitor. <laughs> so, and I was like, okay, well, I mean, what's the answer to that? Yeah. Uh, so I was always like, you know, that's just a bit too much. But um, we, we watch everything. Now, Obviously, Channel 7's competitor is Channel 9. The mm. Herald Sun's competitor is The Age. The Australian's competitor is the AFR. Our business model is different. Like, we're not trying to... This was quite funny to get into the minds of Australian news organisations. We're not here to take anything away from anybody. Mm. We're here to add a voice for people who I feel, as I say, are stateless professionals who travel, um, who love global politics and are interested in the new Apple device, they wake up at four in the morning on that Wednesday of the year when the new iPhone comes out. Um, so, 
you know, everyone covers that story. Does that mean that everyone's our competitor? I'm not really mm -hmm. sure. Sometimes we get compared to um, Bloomberg and I'm like, well, we don't cover markets. Like they're so good at what they're doing. Why wow. on earth would I try and compete with them? Um, in terms of Australia, uh, some people thought, well, you'll be screwed if Channel 9 starts their own streaming news service. Mm -hmm. Why they haven't, I have no idea. Um, and I've told them that. But, uh, and they'll get around to it eventually. But even if they did, we're not a competitor because we have a completely different audience. Channel 9's audience is completely... Be, it would be local again, yeah, even if they weren't local. streaming. Now, if I local. went down the local path, Rachel, I'd have to have three or four reporters in every state, three or four cameramen in every state, producer. At this stage of our business, we can't afford that. We have yeah. some pretty exciting plans, but right now it's just to really stabilise what we're doing at Ticker. Um, and we've got the new set tomorrow morning at 6.30 a.m., our brand new studio gets bumped in. Um, this is something that I'm so proud of. You know, that, that picture of the set that uh, from when I was a little kid, the design of that set that I made out of crepe paper in 1995 or whenever it was, <laughs> is now our set designer at Ticker and I'm paying him to build us a world-class set that comes in tomorrow. So, you know, there's like, it's so exciting to be doing this, to be honest. I couldn't imagine doing anything else. Yeah, for sure, for sure. We're getting all kinds of questions coming in, so I'll just keep firing them at you. Um, Sally says, congratulations, very impressive. Do you think media entrepreneurship should be a part of journalism and media studies courses? I don't know. You didn't. Did you study? It doesn't no, sound like didn't you didn't study uni. journalism uh, at uni. Uh, so. it's kind of, um, that actually has halted my career in many ways um, where I could have gone for jobs overseas and when it gets to the show us your certificates, which is a condition for visa to get into the country. Oh, online. I, I was going to say, no news organisation asked you for your certificate, surely not. But Not anymore. It's quite funny. Like, um, I'm, you know, I've employed hundreds of people over my lifetime so far and I never ask. I never go, what uni did you go to or how did you go? I just go, how passionate are you and do you mind working 24-7? Um, because that's what it takes. Um, so uh, what was the question again? What was the question? <laughs> okay. uh, entrepreneurship um, at uni. Entrepreneurship, um, yes. I, Could it be no. taught as university studies? Or can it, it doesn't sound, it may not be something that, that can necessarily be taught. You know, there were a lot of Olympians who um, just did really fantastic. Should they teach being an Olympian at school? I think it's just in you, right? Um, mm -hmm. I think that school, university gives you the tools that you need to then decipher who you want to be in life. Um mm -hmm. I knew from a very early age, as you've seen, exactly what I wanted to be and I knew how to think. So that kind of was good. There are tools that, I, I mean, I never stopped studying. I never stopped listening to podcasts about things. I never stopped watching history. Um, it never stops. But in terms of entrepreneurship, I think that we have a fantastic opportunity. I mean, there are Australian TikTokers who mm. <laughs> millions of views. Yeah. And you've got free-to-wear networks getting hundreds of thousands of views with hundreds of people working on shows being paid, you know, $100,000. The whole industry has changed. You know, be opportunistic. I always have been. Um, Jed, my business partner, and I, um, you know, he's one of my best friends. I get to come to work and I love the people I work with every day. Um, I have to say that because they're sitting out there watching this. Um, but uh, they, the, they and we are always looking for, new things to do, new opportunities. Um, we might throw everything down here and then go, that isn't working. And the beauty of Ticket is that the second something isn't working, we pull out and we go in a different direction. We did a breakfast show for three months last year. It was a disaster. And we knew it was a disaster and we changed it and went and made everything simple again. So I don't know if you need to be taught that. I think it's just you either got it or you don't. Perhaps being taught the avenues for entrepreneurship so you're aware of what you could do could be a good idea. Um, good question just popped into my head. How involved, I mean, obviously you were on air for years and years and years. Are you on air anymore with Ticker? Are you always just behind the scenes? What role do you play in the day-to-day? -day? The elephant in the room that you've just mentioned. Uh, well, I feel like I was probably on the verge of a nervous breakdown towards the end of last year. Um, running a channel of 17 hours I was anchoring our breakfast show. I was building sets. I was designing graphics. I was dealing with technical problems. I was managing staff. And it was like, again, 
you know, jack of all trades, master at none. And I think that this industry is full of that many egos and you have to have somewhat of an ego to, to continue to do the job. Um, and But I realised that right now the best thing for me to do is to direct the traffic as opposed to be one of the cars. Um, and the people need a leader. When you're doing something new, it became really clear to me last year that the ship was a bit without a rudder. Um, we were doing so much, but no one knew exactly what they were meant to be doing. We'd had so much growth. We'd had so many new people. So we launched something called the Ticker Academy. So I spent all summer trying to design this academy so that all of our staff, and we do it every three months, can know exactly what's expected of them. And do people need to see me every day? Like I'd rather work with people, work with the next generation of reporters and anchors. And, you know, I caught up someone the other day and I'm like, I reckon you should try this. And, and no one ever did that for me. <laughs> no one ever said, Aaron, you know, change your attire or have you tried this or you need more energy or you've got resting bitch face when you're sitting listening to a guest. Like I love being able to now give that advice to people um, and then watch it come out on air. So it's actually a really nice thing to not so much think about myself, but to watch the next generation and to, I guess, hope, hopefully lift them up. You do have a lot, you have a, a pretty young staff and on air talent as well. Um, what's that been like working with young people? And I guess another question that I had was, you know, are, are all, do you, do you have interns? Is everybody, you know, how is, is your staff, is everybody on the books paid? Um, yeah. I guess everyone the who works is, is, yeah, everyone who works yeah. is paid. So, um, and when we first began, that wasn't the case, you know, the first kind of three or four months, it was, can you lend a hand? And we had lots of different shows um, where it was business owners who'd come in and host a program that was really good for their business. Some of them were great shows. Like we had a program called She's the Boss, which was Australia's first show about female bosses. And it was, you know, wonderful. Um, but we have partnerships in terms of internships with RMIT and Sunshine Coast University. Um, I think we have someone from Deakin um, who's popped in as well. So we do do internships and they seem to enjoy it. Like we, we, we are doing something completely different. Um, and, it, and at Sky, we're doing something completely different. So uh, we're literally, I guess, turning something um, that could be amateur into something very professional. So the idea is to essentially encourage the next generation to not just want to work for a company like Ticker, but, you know, when I was starting out, I don't know about you, Rachel, but it was just, I think I sent 365 letters to every TV and radio station in the country and got 364 no's. The one yes I got was from the Winning Post, which turned out to be a horse racing newspaper. And I'm <laughs> like, I don't know anything about that. But, um, yeah, so we, we have a staff, paid staff of 20 people. Um, it's, you know, when you think about that, we've got, Bills of over $100,000 each month that we have to come up with the money for. And we do. We make a profit. We've been profitable since month three. And I'm about to employ a, a reporter in London, a reporter in New York, uh, and another person in Asia um, who will be going and doing live crosses and reporting for us, all paid, uh, holding the ticket microphone out the front of the Houses of Parliament or wherever it might be every day to go live because it's go big or go home for us. It's like... We could have stayed at that little co-working space in YBF and just tried to make as much money out of it as possible. That's just not my style. Um, we could have done eight hours a day, but we decided to do 17 on our way to 24-7 um, because, again, what do you want from a new service? Reliability and honesty. And you want to know that if something big happens, they're not on a break. They're mm -hmm. there live covering it. That's what our expectations are. Um, and we've developed a bunch of systems allowing us to essentially with a team of three per shift have a social media person, an anchor, and a director producer, and that's how we do it. Cool. Uh, Carolyn Tung's asking, uh, she's got two questions. What's your strategy for keep? Or she says, thanks for your lively, entertaining presentation. My questions are, what is your strategy for keeping eyeballs on screens uh, when that screen could be a mobile phone. So I assume, you know, that you're on a phone with a whole bunch of other things that could distract you. And also, two, uh, has production value taken on a different meeting with live streaming? 
Um, first question in terms of uh, mobile, we have been literally designed for mobile from day one. So our graphics that we designed with a company called Light Rise, we have a creative director um, who works out of London for us, who's a very good friend of mine, um, Tim Anderson. He was a creative director for The Ellen Show. He's been the creative director for NBC News, for ABC. Um, and so he's always, he sits in London watching European television and where we're going. Rachel, he wants to take me in places I'm not, I don't think our audience is ready for and we're the next generation. You know, uh, I've just spent all this money on this set you can see behind me here. Um, and now he wants to get rid of the desk and have our presenters scanning. You know, it's like we want to find ways to literally jump out of the screen at you. So it's never meant to feel like a traditional newscast that you might get at 6 p.m. It's an ongoing story. And in terms of how do you compete with other things, you know, on your mobile phone, well, Ticker was also always designed to be chunks of things to watch that just so happens to be recorded live. So if you imagine that we do a half hour bulletin, out of that, we can take about 15 different moments, things from interviews that then get shared and off it goes. Sarah Hansen Young on a Thursday, the finance minister. Um, we've got someone from the Washington Post who was just on um, from some country around the world. Um, we go live to London every day as well. Uh, so we take bits and pieces and it's part of an ongoing conversation. So we don't want to be rolling news, so to speak, because that model has been dead for a long time, which is why news channels are going left or right in opinion. Um, but we want it to feel like you're part of a news stream. And that it's kind of more like Twitter, to be honest, tickers mm. like Twitter, where it's constantly developing and you watch it and you know that this is all you need to get the content you're after. Yeah, interesting. Okay, let's keep going. Um, let's have a little look. Uh, what do you look for when you're employing a journalist? Tips for employability straight out of uni, says Emily. Asks Emily. Very good question. Um, I love people who are tenacious and never give up and don't have an ego. And um, I think, like, I've seen quite a few people who have a lot of naked ambition which exceeds their experience. And so, therefore, it exceeds the expectation and, therefore, it gets, you know, the relationship kicks off on the wrong foot. I think that, I mean, I remember going into the news director of a prominent Melbourne TV network when I was 21 and I get into his office right he's called me in I was a reporter at 3AW and he has his feet on the desk and he says who the f are you and I'm like I'm Aaron and I work at 3AW and you asked me in for a meeting and he says where's your resume and I said uh well it's me. Like, what do you want to know? That's why I'm here. I've already emailed you yeah. my resume. Like, yeah. what do you want to know? And he says, you got no resume. Which university did you go to? And by this point, I was like, hang on. Which university did you go to, mate? <laughs> and he's like, I didn't go to university. It's a waste of time. And I'm like, well, then what does it matter? And anyway, I didn't get the job, but um, I stood my ground. And I think that, like, you want to know a bit about the person you're going in for a meeting with. News directors these days are very stressed people who don't have a huge amount of time and usually have just gotten off the phone for some bad news about the ratings. So you kind of want to be prepared for that. Um, mm -hmm. I like to hire people, and when I think about the people who've come through the door at Ticker, male, female, whoever, um, they just get the product. They want to be here. So learn about the place that you're going for a job interview. When I was about 19, um, I was on the Herald Sun's website when they were taking cadets. Um, I didn't apply, but one thing stuck out, which is before you apply for a Herald Sun cadetship, please make sure you're, you're familiar with our product and that you actually want to work at the Herald Sun, right? A lot of people see a job as a job, but yeah. I see that if you're going to work for an organisation, journalism is a little bit like... Um, being in a church, it's a calling, right? It's, it's long hours, um, often it's being knocked in the head and then getting back up again the next day with a smile on your face. Like that's what journalism is. And unless you love it and love the organisation that you're working for, um, then you're probably not going to have a great time. Yeah. Um, we're jumping around in terms of topics here. Uh, Sandy asks, 
Um, how does TIKA contribute to the preservation of democracy? Well, uh, today, well, yesterday we covered the fact that Sky News has had 30 videos taken off um, YouTube or they've taken 30 videos off YouTube. And then today we covered the fact that the ABC is footing Louise Milligan's $73,000 bill to Andrew Lemming. Before I came on this, I actually went to heaps of different websites and didn't find one organisation covering both those stories. One would cover the Sky News story, one would cover the ABC's bad story. At Ticker, we cover it all. There's no choosing a side politically. As I mentioned, we have Sarah Hansen young and shortly after she comes on from the Greens, we have the Finance Minister, Simon Birmingham. We're an open book. We have a lot of people who are socially progressive who work here. We have a lot of people who vote Liberal who work here. Um, how do I know? Because they debated in the newsroom. They don't all have one opinion. I've worked for places where they're all Liberal or they're all Labor. Um, and that isn't what Ticker is. Ticker is literally meant to be all the, the colours of the rainbow. You know, we celebrated Pride Month just gone by and have promos on air about it. Um, we're a very diverse organisation. We want to be more diverse. Um, and, you know, there are, there are people who I'd love to be able to hire and I look forward to being on their radar one day as well. So um, I, I feel like when you watch Ticker, you're going to get a pretty fairly balanced version of what's happening. Um, we don't just cover the UN's report for, about climate change the other night. We cover what the scientists say and what the economists say. And you be the judge. That's how we look at it. Sally asked, do you have a gender breakdown of your audiences? 50, 50. We have a young girl, Kira Wright, who is a very proud feminist. Um, she tells us and she wear, literally wears a badge um, to say this in the office. And, you know, she is obsessed with making sure that our coverage, um, you know, I mentioned that she's the boss program. We had a program called Tick Her as well. Um, but... She has gone through our statistics and she said, Ooh. I can't believe, oh, what happened to you? The lights have turned off. Hang on. <laughs> <laughs> you need more ad sales there at the age, I think. No, geez, hello, and we're back. <laughs> I need uh, it's 54% uh, male and 46% female. Our Twitter account is literally 50-50 male and female. So uh, for us, you know, in terms of we cover a lot of tech, and she said, I can't believe that this is a news organisation which is able... We, we literally write... We had a story the other day about um, where women on boards of ASX companies are listed. We had a story about the most prominent female executives around the world. Um, and this isn't something that we do because we want to do better with female viewers. I just, as I said earlier, our viewers are millennial stateless people. We have these characters... Oh, uh, an insight. So when we have our big meetings and we talk, who's our viewers? They're both 29 years old. One is called Joel and one is called Emily. And Joel and Emily, I think Emily in our mind lives in Fitzroy and Joel lives in Windsor. Joel works at Deloitte and is on his way up and has gone to university. And yeah. if you go to Joel's Facebook or Instagram, he's at, you know, Machu Picchu. He's traveling the world, going to cool places. Um, and then you have a look at Emily and uh, she could be a nurse or she could be working for KPMG. One day they might meet, um, but that's our audience and that's who we talk to. And every time we ask ourselves, is this a ticker story, they're the two people that we think of when we're talking to them, not just Joel and not just Emily. It has to kind of appeal to both. Yeah, for sure. We're getting to the end of our time, Aaron, so I'm going to just pick maybe one or two more. Um, I'm not going to be able to get to everyone. Apologies, but I'm just trying to make sure that we're not going over covered ground. Feel free uh, to email me, guys, as well. Um, yeah, that's you know, just... I, It's so frustrating. I'm very open about stuff, as you can see. Um, Aaron with an H. Um, don't ask me why there's an H. I still haven't figured that out. But A-H-R-O-N <laughs> at Ticker News, T-I-C-K-E-R-N-E-W-S dot co. Um, and I'll do my best, of course. I try yeah. to answer everybody who emails me. For sure. Uh, Steve asked, with what Aaron knows now about how to make a success of Tigger, what would he change about the way he started the network? I wouldn't have moved three times. I wouldn't have built about 15 different sets. Um, it's all a journey, right? It's like I don't look at where I am now and say that 
where any, I think I'm about 1% of the journey is how I look at it. Um, this isn't what you see now. We literally have a new set coming in tomorrow, Rachel. And mm -hmm. last night I walked around the building and went, this is where the next set's going to go. This is where the newsroom is going to move to in about a year's time. So, um, uh, gosh, two years ago, the 19th of August was our first day on air. Who would have thought that coronavirus was about to hit? Um, who would have thought? But I think that the advice I would have is um, to be free, to be uh, as big as you can and for distribution and for the graphics, et cetera, to be the first thing you focus on because right. that's people like your branding. In the yeah. end, all news organisations are brands, right? That's what we are these days. And to focus heavily on your brand from day one, that would be my advice. Yeah, that leads into a question from Gregory. Is the ticket brand strength increasing? Um, you spoke about this before. He's also asked who is it, who is either side of you in the market? But I guess just in terms of, yeah, you're, you're, the ticket brand, um, do you think it's, yeah. Do you it's think funny, it's like in Australian media, there aren't many people. Like we got invited um, up to uh, the headquarters of Channel 9 in Sydney and, and they all knew about us. We are literally standing in Mike Sneesby, the CEO's office at one point. Um, you know, I get messages from journos at CNN, Bloomberg. They're all fully aware of Ticker. How do we get that out to people? Um, I mentioned it being a bit like a religion. We just have to constantly beat expectations. Whenever people go to our website, we hope that if they're our audience, they'll find something they like, that our audio sounds great, our graphics look great, our presenters are engaging. It's an ongoing thing. Um, when the iPad first came out, Rupert Murdoch spent $40 million on um, this thing called The Daily. It was a iPad-only news service because everyone back then thought that iPads were going to save the news industry. Yeah. It failed after a year, and he did an interview with the Wall Street Journal, and they said, why did it fail? And he said, because people didn't want a new brand. They wanted the brands that they loved on a new device. And here I am starting a new brand. So I can't replicate what somebody else is doing. I can't try to compete with them. I never can. But I can go for the people who don't have a, a place, who don't have a place to get all that news that they want in one place. And that's what we try to be. So um, just by hopefully continually um, trying to be better, that constant um, chase for perfection, the team environment, people having a good experience, that hopefully will continue to increase our brand. And who knows, maybe CNN one day will say we're the old version of Ticker. Yeah, perhaps. Is that where you'd like to eventually kind of, um, you know, it, it, what's the long term? You know, where's where, what's the... Is there an end goal? What's, you know, where is where is Ticker? I think as we build up our brand, as we kind of are in the position of a finance company that you trust, um, you know, we cover crypto, we cover all sorts of stuff. When you're in that space, opportunities present themselves. The Oxford University um, and Reuters study of journalism for 2020 said that the trends for news brands going forward are that they become retailers. Now, in many ways, as I mentioned about Ticker, where you can buy your clip if you come in for an interview, is a retailer. BuzzFeed are starting to sell sex toys because of their hugely trusted sex range on the BuzzFeed website or cooking, things like that. Literally, the opportunity is once you create a trusted brand, you look at what are people willing to buy from you. From day one, people were willing to buy something from Ticker. And so I think when you look at that, look at all of our lives. Like my Instagram, I buy more stuff that pops up in my Instagram feed than I do anywhere else. So that's the trust and, and you just don't know where that's going to take you. For sure. Just to round it out, I've got to ask for the for the young young people in the audience, are there still any vacancies for journalists to join? And somebody else has asked, is there any room for boomers at Ticker? So if you wanted to, uh, <laughs> essentially, are you, are you hiring? And um, do you have to be a do you have to be a young millennial to to join Ticker? No, you don't. Um, are we we are always hiring. We are always looking for people. Um, finding people is really really difficult um, all the time. We one of the things that I love about doing things like this, you know, I um, I think like a month after I started Ticker, I went to Maclay College and was invited to go and, and give a um, a talk. And when I got back to the office, it was just up the road in Burke Street from where they were in, 
Elizabeth or Swanson, I can't remember. Um, two journalists had beaten me, two uni students had beaten me back to the office because they loved the talk so much that they wanted to get involved. And Holly was one of them and she's one of our anchors here at Ticker Now. So um, we're really open. Like I love hearing from people, whether it's internships, whether it's um, people who just have seen the brand, love what we do. Um, absolutely. And in terms of boomers, I'm 39. This was going to be an under 40s news network, Rachel. And then I went, holy shit, I'm 37. <laughs> I've got up to 45. <laughs> so, uh, you know, we're pretty open. Yeah, nice. All right. Thank you so much for your time, Aaron. I've, I've, I've stolen a little more of your time than we, oh, than we right. anticipated. But um, as, as, as you said, if people have um, extra questions or want to get in touch with Aaron, um, what's your email address again, Aaron? I'll type uh, it out. It is Aaron with an H, A-H-R-O-N, at yep. tickernews.co. I mean, right now, if we were at the pub, we'd all be having a drink, right, and getting to know each exactly. other. Exactly, yeah. can't do that. But since we can't, please email me. And um, perhaps, you know, as soon as things open, everyone, we always encourage people to come and see the studios. There are a lot of, you know, mini news organisations that are just from a garage. We literally have built a proper workplace for people and we want to show it off. So come and have a look. Great. Thank you so much for your time, Aaron. We're going to be sending a little gift your way down to the Ticker Studios. Um, thank you so much again for your Thank you as well. Tonight. Yeah, thank you and thank you to, for everyone. Not, for, not for at all. And again, Sometimes we sit in our office and go, who cares what we're doing? It's so good to see people are watching and care. So uh, it's really, it's yeah, been fascinating. You, you've been on uh, my guest list for, for quite a while to get on. Um, so thanks very much. Um, thanks to the Copyright uh, Agency Cultural Fund, which has been supporting the edit for a long time now. Um, we'll hopefully all see you in person for the next edit event. We will see. Um, thanks to David and Will for, uh, thanks to Will from the Press Club, who's helped organise the logistics for tonight and running everything behind the scenes. And finally, thanks to all um all of you all of the people who've paid for, for tickets to come along tonight your um your continued support during these crazy times is really really valuable um so stay in touch with the edit and melbourne press club and we'll see you all again soon see you later